What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. If this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of data science related content, and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. All right, so as you can probably tell from the title of this video, I just hit 1,000 subscribers on this channel last week, and I would like to thank each and every single one of you. I started this channel a few months ago primarily to share my own opinions and experiences from the data science field as a whole. Because it's been my personal experience, there's way too much stuff that I see out there, especially from academia, that really overhypes and overemphasizes things like neural networks and deep learning. Now that's not to say at all that those things aren't awesome, I love all that stuff. But I think it leads a lot of people to some seriously unrealistic expectations about what the field actually entails and what data science really is. So it's been my mission to share my own perspective just as somebody who's been in data science for close to six years now. I've also tried to bring forward simple, straightforward, and practical educational content. Because in my opinion, that's another problem that's out there in the data science field. There's way too much educational content out there, and I think a lot of it is very seriously disconnected from the things people actually do in their day-to-day -day if they're working in a data science job. A lot of the stuff that's out there, it's way too surface level, like reading a CSV in Pandas, or it's just way too theoretical. So thank you to all of you who've subscribed to my channel because you've helped me make what it is so far. And I do actually read each and every single comment that I get. So keep leaving me comments with your thoughts as well as your take on what kinds of topics I should cover next. Occasionally I talk about things like communication and data visualization. And these are super important things in the field, but unfortunately they can get overlooked a little bit in favor of, once again, cooler and sexier things. But at the end of the day, you need to tell a story with your data, and to do that, you need to communicate well. And some good tools to do that are graphs and charts. So as a 1,000 subscriber special, I thought I would do something completely different from what I usually do with this channel. Usually what I'm doing with this channel is I'm presenting my own experiences, or I'm teaching some kind of content. That way, I can be a peer who's been in data science for some time now, who, for people who are aspiring to get in the field, they're currently in the field now, or maybe you're just an interested observer, I can be somebody you can learn something from. Then if I'm really lucky, maybe I'm somebody whom you can even share some laughs with along the way. Well, this video is different. I thought rather than doing something serious where I'm talking about the data science industry and whether it's going to die in a few years, or I'm presenting some kind of educational content on statistics, that I could do something that's purely for entertainment purposes. There's this article about the 27 worst graphs ever. It was published in Business Insider in the year 2013, but these graphs stick around to haunt all of us to this day. So I thought it would be fun to torture myself on camera and go through all these graphs and give my own thoughts and reactions to them. Now one thing to note, I'm only going to go through 25 of the 27 because the other two sort of delve into some subject matter content that I really don't want to get into in this channel. If you're interested in them, the link will be in the description. So without further ado, enjoy my 1000 subscriber special. So here's graph number one, and right off the bat, it's a pie chart, which can already tell you that it's not great. But to add insult to injury, there's these little subcomponents inside the pie chunks, so it's almost like a pie chart inside of a pie chart. Or as I would prefer to put it, it's like suck inside of suck. Now this one was discovered inside some blog that was titled Junk Charts, so at least that was a pretty accurate descriptor. Next up, we have a graph that represents the annual sales of various fast food chains in the US. So I guess the takeaway from this is, yay McDonald's, I guess. I'm just trying to figure out why the GDP of Afghanistan is on this chart. Either way, the idea they're trying to get at here is that McDonald's has three times the annual sales as Burger King, but the actual area here is nine times bigger. 
So if you're reading this graph, you look at it and it just confuses you at first. And the moral of the story is, please don't use flashy graphics like this when you're making a graph or a chart. Now this next one, I guess, is on Major League Soccer player salaries. And I'm not gonna lie, this one is so obnoxious looking and has so much going on that I don't even aesthetically even want to look at it. I don't know, this might just be the American in me coming out, but this graph honestly makes me care about soccer even less than I already did before. So I guess there's one thing this graph accomplished. Moving on to this next one, this is from Bloomberg. Now I guess all the percentages next to the food at the top are the imports, and then if you look at the bottom by the countries, those are the exports, but there's way too much of just moving my eyeballs around all over the place that I have to do in order to figure that out. I'm really not sure which thing annoys me more here. The fact that there's all these percentages at the bottom, and they're all for different groups, so you're looking at them, expecting them to add up to 100, and they don't. Or the fact that there's an onion in the middle here, and there's this pie slice that's coming out of it. Like, I really want to meet the person who actually chops their onions like that. Then this one is from Gallup, and it's a 2012 poll of the percentage of LGBT individuals across each state. Now, number one here, I guess, was Hawaii at 5.1%. The last one here was North Dakota. That came in at 1.7%. But you would never know that from looking at this graph, because there's no information whatsoever that you're going to glean from this color scale. This next one is from Globe and Mail, and it's another convoluted and overly complicated infographic. This one is on the gun laws in each state. I really don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at here. There's way too much information on here. I mean, I guess a lot of states in the US ban guns in the workplace, so that's one thing I learned, I guess. But I must say, the thing that annoys me the most about this graph is the fact that it looks like it's in alphabetical order for parts of it, and then it'll just stop. Like at the top, you've got New York, New Mexico, New Hampshire, Nevada, what the hell, California? Whatever. Now on the threat of firearms, we have an even worse graph. This is almost an exercise in how many different colors that you can splash onto a page while still getting as little information across as possible. I really have no idea what all these purple and orange and gray pie chunks next to Hawaii are. I mean, maybe there's some context here that I'm missing to get this, but if I need that outside context that much to understand your graph, it's because your graph is bad. Now we've got a graph on the drinking age in the various provinces of Canada. Wonderful stuff. First of all, nobody, and let me reiterate that, nobody, expresses age as 17.6 years, 18.2 years. If you're actually one of those people, send me a DM and I will bring you on this channel to interview you, and I mean that. But really, did we seriously need a graph that has only two unique numbers on it? I don't know what to tell you. Now this next one was described by Edward Tufte as the worst graph ever made. And honestly, I'm looking at this chart and it kind of looks like I took a sheet of white paper and then just puked all over it. And I think that if I did that, that would honestly be more informative and give you more information than this chart does. This next one is from Fox News, and there's a lot of problems here. So first of all, the time points on the graph are all equally distant from each other, but they're not represented as equally distant on this graph. And then for no reason whatsoever, there is a line that's drawn through these points, even though this information is not linear. I guess they took the y-axis difference and then just threw that difference onto the y-axis? I don't know, I'm probably reading too much into it. This graph sucks. So, everybody's talking about fake news and fake polls these days. Can we all start talking about fake graphs and fake charts? That'd be great. And apparently in the world of this graph, 8.6% is higher than 9%. I'm offended, you guys. I'm offended as a taxpayer. I'm offended as a data scientist. I'm offended as a human. And now we have another one from Fox News. Now I have to say, at first glance, this one isn't quite as badly designed as the others, 
but it's still pretty seriously misleading. First of all, the y-axis doesn't start at zero. I guess it starts at 150,000. Now that's not always a deal breaker with a graph, but you could tell that they did that by design because they're purposely trying to exaggerate the difference between 2012 and 2013. But worse than that is the fact that the x-axis here isn't even accurate. Because what they did here was they found these random months from each of these years. They're actually graphing those months and then they just slapped the year label on them. So it's just confusing. So somebody at Fox News needs to find their data professionals and somebody needs to get fired all over all of these because these are ridiculous. But hey, as Business Insider points out, the other side of the aisle sucks too. This is taken from Barack Obama's 2013 State of the Union address. I'm really confused about why this is presented as a Venn diagram, considering China's and the United States' investments in renewable energy are completely separate and distinct piles of money. But even on top of that, China has quadrupled the number of people that the US does and has different energy needs, but whatever. Thanks Obama. I thought things were going to change. Apparently not. This next one is from the Winnipeg Sun in Canada. And I must admit, this one might be the most unintentionally accurate of all of them. I mean, I can sort of relate to this one. So the Patriots, they win for the 10th straight time in a row. The halftime show is boring. So if somebody actually came up to me and they asked what my favorite part of the Super Bowl was, I would probably look them in the eye and just say no. So this graph has that going for it, I guess. And here we have more politicians doing bad Venn diagrams. This one courtesy of Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. And this one is equally ridiculous. I mean, I guess what he's trying to do here is he's trying to use the black part that's overlapping to represent the gap between the blue and the red parts. But that's quite literally the exact opposite of what the overlapping part of a Venn diagram is supposed to represent. You know when Mark Twain said back in the day that there are three kinds of lies? Lies, damn lies, and statistics? Why didn't he throw politicians into that mix? I feel like that was a really gross oversight on his part. Alright, enough politics. Here's one from scientific literature. Now this one tells the incredibly compelling and exciting story that susceptibility allele frequency starts at zero, then goes to zero, it's zero for some more time, and then it ends at zero. Congratulations, you took up half a page to say exactly nothing. Do you want a cookie for that? This next one, again, I think is from scientific literature. And now, in all walks of life, generally, I try to stay away from using too absolute of statements because things are complex, they're nuanced, and there's exceptions to everything. But in this case, I feel completely confident in saying that in the entire history of graphable phenomena, right now and in the entire future until mankind dies off, there has never been, there is not now, and there will never be any set of circumstances in which you should ever use a 3D cylinder plot. Awkward looking, clumsy, hard to read, confusing, I've said all that I need to say. Here's some more bad 3D graphs for you. Now I can't even look at this one without getting a headache. And I mean, when I was preparing this video, I was squinting at this one and trying to look and distinguish the difference between South Korea and Vietnam. But then I started feeling like I was getting a seizure, so I gave up and I decided I would try to do something that hurts my eyeballs less, like stare at the sun for a couple hours or something. This next one is from LinkedIn. So I guess this Kirsten person and I have no skills in common, no views in common, no connections in common. So right off the bat, my first thought was, well, that's great to be Kirsten, I guess. But I'm also kind of taking this with multiple tablespoons of salt. But that's me. Next one is from the Wall Street Journal, and it's all about Obama's divided nation. I don't know, what do you guys think? Does this look really divided to you? Looks extremely divided to me. I don't know what else you want me to say. And now we've got one which has received the title of worst pie chart of all time. Now I have to say that is some seriously below the belt stuff. Like that's pretty much like being told you're the shortest kid in kindergarten. I swear I've looked at this exact graph way too many times because clearly I have nothing better to do with my time. 
and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what this big blue section in the middle is. We may never know. We may all be better off for that. This next one is from Gizmodo, and they were trying to communicate that the new iPad has a battery life that's 70% longer than the old iPad, but people can't help themselves, and they have to change the entire area so that it's way bigger than 70% a difference between the new and the old. You know, I may have let these guys off the hook if they had incorporated into this graph that the new iPad forces you to buy some new charger, and that new charger is 70% more expensive than the old one, but, but no, they, they couldn't do that. And if you thought that one was bad, we have probably the worst one on this entire list. Apparently 29.4 is double of 0 0.7, 2.4 is double of 0, 30.9 is actually greater than 56.9, everybody is addicted to opiates and booze and cocaine, the universe is broken and everything is stupid. And next up, you guys know what I dislike even more than a pie chart? When you have 32 pie charts and I dislike them even more when there's some weird stacking effect going on for most of them. Like, remember earlier in this video when I said that there has never been, nor is there now, nor will there ever be in the future any circumstance in which you should use a 3D cylinder chart? Yeah, I'm pretty comfortable saying the exact same thing about stacked pie charts too. Then here we are on the last one of this list, which is good because I really don't know how much more of this I can take. This is all about workplace commutes, and at this point, I really don't know what else to say. I mean, I guess New York City uses a lot of public transit, and Houston doesn't, so I'd be really interested to see a follow-up of this kind of thing after the pandemic is all said and done, but in virtually any style, that's not this one. Like, do some kind of style that's better than this, like pie charts. Yes, you actually got me to recommend using pie charts as an alternative to what you were doing before. I hope you're proud of yourself. Alright, if you're still watching this, you probably feel like your brain needs a bath by this point. And if there's anything serious that you can take away from this whatsoever, it's that you should strive to make simple, clear, easy to understand graphs. Otherwise, who knows, your graph just might end up getting taken by Business Insider, they post an article about it, and then some other guy on the internet makes bad jokes and makes fun of your graph. And nobody wants that. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to support my work, the most helpful thing that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, at least consider smashing the like button. And also leave me a comment down below and let me know which one you thought was the worst graph. Thank you to everybody who's subscribed to my channel so far, and hopefully many more to come as we move forward. So until next time, Richard on Data.